that they have the requisite forms and information to be able to participate. Um, a special thank you to Edwin Chikukwa, uh, better known as Eddie, at least to us. Uh, Eddie slash Edwin was a, a Senate fellow in our office for a year and, and was just an, a, an amazing staff person. Um, and I know he's an amazing staff person at the California Student Aid Commission. We're also joined by Yahara Lechuga, a uh, former elementary school teacher who is now also with us to our great good fortune. Uh, so a college education is a portal to both a higher quality of life and, and one would hope uh, greater financial success in life, being able to support yourself and your family. Uh, sadly, that opportunity is not equal for everyone in California. I, I know from my own experience growing up in the Midwest, my family, a family of five children, I was the oldest. Uh, my family didn't have resources to send me to college. So I had to look for alternate means to be able to uh, find a higher education. And, and the alternate means for me was the United States Army. That's not for everyone, but that's, that's what we had to do at the time. And at that point, colleges were much, much cheaper. Uh, higher education didn't cost nearly as much as today. So it's critically important, in my view, that everyone who has the talent, ability, dedication, and perseverance to be able to attend college, that, that they be able to do so. And as a prerequisite, what you have to do first in order to get the financial resources, to get the aid, to get the loans, to get the grants, to get the scholarships, to be able to do that, is, is you have to fill out uh, certain forms. And so that's what we're about here today. Uh, you know, we, we're aware that the, the pandemic has made that even more difficult because many of you aren't in school um, in in-person classrooms, that you're in school virtually. So that makes it even more challenging uh, because you don't have sort of the informal network and the formal structure to, to help you. Uh, you know, we're working on it. Uh, as, 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 as you could probably see from the screen, I'm a state senator. We represent um, cities from Santa Ana in northern Orange County, northern central Orange County through Garden Grove and, and uh, Los Alamitos and Fountain Valley and uh, Seal Beach and Huntington Beach and all the way up in, into Long Beach and Westminster. I'm sure I've forgotten another one of my cities. Um, so we're in our job, our job is to be of assistance to you. So if you have questions, you should call our office. If you have questions about the application, about uh, gaining um, information about, about how to fill out the applications, we're, we're trying to do our part too by making sure that students are ready for college by we introduced a bill to make sure that every student in California has a library card. For those of you who have visited libraries, you know how important they are, what a great resource they are, especially, especially for folks who, um, who may not have the resources at home, as was the case in the home that I grew up in. So let me, let me turn this over now to, to Edwin or Eddie, um, as it were, uh, to, to follow. Up. So once again, thank you, the California Student Aid Commission. Thank you, Yahara, and thank you, Eddie. Thank you so much, Senator Umberg and team. Really appreciate you for allowing us to be here and to talk to your constituents about financial aid. So before we get started, I'm going to go to the next slide. Let's just go over what our goals are for today. So we're going to be reviewing parts of the application that may be difficult. I'm just going to give you a warning. There's two applications we will be talking about today. We have the free application for federal student aid and the California Dream app application. You only need to fill out one application and we'll let you know which one you should be filling out. We'll answer your questions and you can ask these questions while the presentation is going on because lucky for you today, we have some amazing CSAC staff. We have John Waldrop, we have Yesenia Castellon and we have Humphrey Manaxa who will all be available to answer your questions throughout this presentation. So please, please, use the Q&A function. Uh, if you look at the panel at the bottom of your screen, you have a Q&A function. Please use the Q&A function and avoid using the chat. It'll make life so much easier. Um, it'll make it easier for them to answer your questions. So please, 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 by all means, use the Q&A function and don't be shy. These people are experts. They know what they're talking about. So ask questions throughout this presentation. 
And also, we would like to provide helpful resources while we're going through this presentation. So if you have questions, you'll give you resources, phone numbers that you can contact so that we can follow up with you and help you out if you need that help. Or you can follow up with us and ask your questions if we don't get to everything that we need to get through to today. So with that, we will begin. So like I mentioned earlier, there are two applications, right? There is the free application for federal student aid, which is the FAFSA application. And then there is the California Dream Act application. Now, the difference between these two applications is that the, fa the federal application for student aid, that is a federal application that is for citizens, permanent residents, and uh, people uh, with certain statuses. Whereas the California Dream Act application is for undocumented students. We'll go in a little bit more about the requirements for each application further, but we just want to make sure that when you're talking about financial aid, please talk about both applications. Don't just mention the FAFSA. We know FAFSA is the most common one. We know most students would be filling out the FAFSA, but we really do want you to mention the California Dream Act application. Why? Well, this year alone, we have seen an 11% decrease in FAFSA applications for high school seniors and a 45% decrease in California Dream Act application for first time high school senior applicants who are applying to college. So it's important that we say this. It's important that we put that message out there. There is still aid for both um, undocumented students as well as FAFSA filers who are permanent residents or citizens. And remember, if you have questions, please feel free to ask. Now, another thing that we really want to get out of the way so that people understand is that these applications use what is called prior prior tax information. So when they're asking you for that tax information, when you need to fill it out, whether it's your student tax information or your parent tax information, they're talking about 2019 tax information. So since this is 21, 22, this is the academic year that the applications are about, they would be asking you for your 2019 tax information. Now, I know that's going to raise some immediate alarm bells for some of y'all, because the first question that comes to mind is, well, what if my 2019 tax information does not reflect my current situation? Don't worry, we'll talk about that. We will get to that on how to reconcile those issues. Now, how much money can I get, which is probably the reason the majority of you are here. You want to know, OK, what can I get out of this? What is the point of filling out this application? Well, while we get into that, we want you to understand how the calculation is made. So the first thing is cost of attendance. Cost of attendance is going to look at the school you're going to. So for example, if you're going to a private school, it's going to be very different from going to a public school and very different from going to a, between a four-year and a community college. So all these things will have a different cost of attendance. Then once we figure out the cost of attendance, which is calculated by the institution that you're picking, then we look at expected family contribution. Now, expected family contribution, that is going to come from a combination of your household size, which we'll talk about how that's calculated, your income and assets, all that information. Once we look at that information, we'll say, OK, this student can roughly afford to contribute this much to their education. And then once we have the cost of attendance and the expected family contribution, we'll subtract the expected family contribution from the cost of attendance, and that will give us your student financial need. Now let's talk about federal aid. And while we're talking about federal aid, I do want to be clear, this is mainly talking, this is only talking to FAFSA filers, because unfortunately, undocumented students will not be able to qualify for federal aid. So when I'm talking about federal aid right now, this is FAFSA filers, free application for federal student aid filers. We'll talk about the California Dream Act a little bit later. But what is some of the maximum aid you can get from the federal government? The first thing is the Pell Grant. This is about $6,345 that you can get. That's the max you can get. Now, not everybody is going to get that money. Um, unfortunately, not everybody is going to get that money. However, we still recommend that you apply because you don't know whether you apply until you apply. So once again, that is the max amount. Not everybody will be able to get it, but it's still worth applying because there's other aid, as you can see. For example, the next bullet point talks about federal work study. Now, the easiest way to describe federal work study is this. Let's say you have a student, they're looking for a job and they find a job on campus and the job is a work study job. What means when it says it's a work study job, it means if the job is paying $10 an hour, and by the way, I'm using very hypothetical numbers here. If the job is paying $10 an hour, the federal government will subsidize some of that salary. So they will pay about $4, let's say, this is hypothetical, they'll pay $4, whereas your employer would only pay $6. Now, 
you can automatically see why that would make you an attractive student if you are a student who has work study, because the employer who's hiring you on your campus now knows, hey, I can get that student, pay them, and not have to pay them as much, but they're still getting the money that they deserve. They're still getting their hourly wage, and I don't have to pay them as much. So I'm most likely going to hire that student who has work study. So if you're offered work study, we always say, take it, take it take it because it runs out and we know a lot of students are confused about it but this is what it pretty much means it incentivizes students to work and it also incentivizes um, the campus or the community to hire you if you have work study now the loans subsidizing and subsidized loans as you can see there's a pretty broad range from 5,500 to 12,500 part of that is because as each year goes by a student increases their borrowing amount. So there's, it's not necessarily fixed, but so as each year goes by, so let's say a freshman will be able to, a sophomore will be able to borrow more than a freshman and junior more than a, a sophomore. So pretty much as it goes by, your ability to borrow increases. But there are some differences between the loans. And I, I'm just gonna talk about all the loans. Let me just include the plus loan there. That is for parents. That is a loan the parents take on behalf of their student. So let's start off by talking about the similarities of the loans. The first main similarity is that all of them have a fixed interest rate. So you're not gonna be worried about the interest rate varying, unlike with other private loans, you know what you get, what you sign, that is the interest rate you'll be paying for the loan. It's a fixed interest rate. So subsidized, unsubsidized, plus loan, all of them have a fixed interest rate. The difference though is the subsidized loan does not accrue interest while you are in school. Whereas the unsubsidized loans and the plus loans do accrue interest while you're in school. So once again, you can automatically see which one, if you're offered these um, awards, which will be the best one to take. But this is just a brief overview of what federal aid looks like. And once again, people, please, if you have questions, make the CSAC people work. They are here to answer your questions. Please, please, please ask as many questions as possible. They're getting paid to do this. So please ask them questions. Now, how much state aid can I receive? So y'all can see the numbers here. I'm not gonna go through every single number, but as you can see, at a youth institution, you would get $12,570. That would cover um, your tuition and fees. That would go to tuition and fees. CSU, different numbers, community college. Um, at a community college, you would get a, actually we'll talk about it on the next slide, but y'all can just see these numbers. I'm gonna let y'all look at these numbers for like five seconds, just so that you can get an idea of what is the state aid you can receive. And also, um, undocumented students, so those of you who will be filing the California Dream Act application, you would be able to qualify for state aid. So FAFSA filers and CADA filers, you'd be able to qualify for this kind of aid. So just take a look at it, look and see, okay, these are all the different options, take it in. I hope as you see all these dollar signs, you realize that it's worthwhile to try and apply for financial aid because it's free and you could potentially get all this money. So take a look at it, soak it in, take a screenshot, think about it, meditate on it, we're good to go, okay. Next slide. So while we're talking about state aid, we have what is called the Cal Grant program, the California grant. We have a Cal Grant A, a Cal Grant B, and a Cal Grant C. Uh, so as you can see, there's some differences between the funding allocations. So with Cal Grant A, if you are at a community college, it gets put on reserve. Uh, but if you are at a four-year public university, it will go to tuition and fees. And if you had a private nonprofit, it will go to that, but it's, it's a different amount. And it's also a different amount for for-profit. For now, for those of you who are interested in going to for-profit schools, you might want to check um, our website to see which ones would qualify. You can check all that information on our website. If you're interested in general, would this school qualify for a Cal grant? You can check on our website. But a pretty safe bet is if it's a public university, it's, it's probably going to qualify. It is going to qualify. Now, with the Cal grant B, Cal grant B is a, not the, the B program of the Cal grant. Um, in addition, it has what is called an access award. So you can use this at a community college, the $1,656 access award. And you can use that for books and supplies. So that's the difference between a Cal Grant A and a Cal Grant B. The Cal Grant B has an access award. It also has its own set of requirements that are slightly different. And then at a CSU and a UC, you can use it to cover tuition and you can also get the access award as you can see with other institutions too. So that's Cal Grant B. Cal Grant C is for vocational school or technical training. So if you're going to a community college and you're getting a tech, uh, you're getting technical training and something, you can have the option to get a Cal Grant C. I believe the minimum requirement is your program has to be a minimum of about four months in order to qualify for this. But this is all just going to say that there is aid for different types of education. Uh, please just apply. Once again, no guarantees that everybody's going to get this, 
uh, but it's worthwhile applying because you don't know up until you apply. Now, I know some of you, when you're seeing this, you're saying, okay, we're not guaranteed to get all this aid. And this is a question which I know will come up in the, if it's not, if it hasn't already come up in the Q&A, I know it's in some of y'all's minds where, where you're thinking, well, I'm middle class and I might make a little bit more money. And I know most of these grant aid is going to low income students. So is there any purpose in me even applying? What's the point? Well, yes, there's absolutely a purpose in you applying. And we still want you to apply because once again, you can qualify for a whole bunch of things that you might not even know that you could qualify for. And one of those things is the middle class scholarship. And the middle class scholarship can waive up to 40% of tuition and fees at a public university. 40% of tuition and fees. That is a complete difference from having zero. So all you have to do to potentially qualify for this if you are middle class is apply. Literally just falling off this application. So that's why we continuously want to emphasize the importance of applying. It doesn't hurt you. It can only help you. The other thing is the Chafee grant for foster youth. Um, so if you've been in foster care for at least a day between the age of 16 and 18, you can qualify for up to $5,000 a year. And you only have to fill out this Chafee grant once. So please, if you know any students who would meet this requirement, who've been in foster care for a day between the ages of 16 and 18, please also encourage them to apply. Now, this application, the Chafee Grant, that can also be found on our website. I have a feeling John Yaseno Humphrey might post um, some links to that so because they're pretty good at that. So once again, keep asking them questions. They're there to answer your questions. They'll be able to take care of your questions. So please ask them if something I said didn't make sense. Please bug them. They're getting paid to do this. They love doing this. So ask. Now, let's talk about your application before you begin. Remember, each student must fill out one application. You shouldn't fill out both. You should not fill out both. You should only fill out one application. We'll talk about what happens if you fill out the wrong application, but you should only fill out one application. So you wanna make sure that you have your full name. Now this sounds really, really simple, full name. And you're gonna see this over and over again in the presentation. This sounds really simple, full name. How could I mess up my name? You will be surprised how many people mess up their names. And how can you make sure that you don't mess up your name? If you are filing the FAFSA, you want to make sure that your name is the same as what's on your social security card. So make sure that your name is the same. If you are filing the CADA and you wanna make sure that your name is the same as what's on your school records. We'll talk about that why a little bit later when we talk about reasons why applications don't go through, but I cannot emphasize this enough. Please get your name right. I have a long name, I understand. It's, I didn't even spell my whole full name for all of you. But it's long and I understand sometimes it can be a little bit difficult, but the one time you want to make sure you get your name right is when you're filling out these applications. Next thing, next thing is usernames and passwords, um, emails, address used, we'll talk about that. You want to make sure that you avoid using an institutional email. You want to use a personal email that you will have access to um, for multiple years. Because remember, these applications, except for the JFE grant, need to be filled out on a yearly basis. PIN numbers, secret questions and answers, write those things down. Um, so that you have them once again. Remember, these applications are filled out yearly. So let's talk about the FAFSA. Who can apply? I already mentioned this, but I want to make sure that it's clear. U.S. citizens can apply for the FAFSA. Legal permanent residents um, with certain designations, including refugees, those grand asylum, it's, it's there on the slide, T visa holders. That's who can apply for the FAFSA. That's who should be applying for the FAFSA. And so think, think about that. Um, just think about that, marinate on that. If you fall into this designations or if you have any of these specific statuses, then you should be applying for the FAFSA. You should not be filling out the California Internet application. Good. Glad I cleared that up. Creating an FSA ID. So, and also I'm going to move this panel bar at the bottom here. Where is my mouse? Perfect. Okay, I'm going to move that there so y'all can see that beautiful, glorious number to call if you have any questions. Uh, the cool thing about the federal government is they, they understand that the application can be a little bit complicated. We get that. That's why you're here at this workshop. So they have a hotline where they can help you and feel free to call that hotline during business hours. We'll also talk about our number, but it, you can call us too and we can help you with the FAFSA or the CADA. But remember, the federal government did make this application, so they're probably the best experts on this application. So feel free to call them if you get stumped on a question or call us, but if you're filling out the FAFSA. But with that being said, creating an FSA ID. If you do not already have an FSA ID, you want to make sure that you have one. Uh, it is important because, as you can see on this slide, that is what you will use to sign your application. 
And also very important for dependent students. What is a dependent student? We will talk about that, how that's classified. What a dependent means is that you need your parents to fill out the application. You need your parents to fill out the application. So if you are a dependent student, and we will talk about what classifies a dependent student, I promise we'll get to that, then your parents also need to create their own separate FSA ID. Um, as you can see there, if you forgot your FSA ID, you can go and uh, forgot username on the FAFSA login page. But it's important, important that for dependent students, dependent students, that they create their own personal separate FSA ID and that their parents create their own personal separate FSA ID. This is important to sign the application. And once again, we'll talk about the exceptions um, to this, uh, to this rule. So creating a signature page. So as you can see, there will be exceptions to this rule because I just talked about FSA ID. Now the FSA ID, you need a social security number. And for some parents, we understand that people live in mixed status households. So sometimes you'll have a student who's, let's say, a citizen or a permanent resident, and their parent does not have uh, legal status, or they're just having issues with their social security. And so because of that, they can create an FSA ID. So the question you're wondering is, well, if the FSA ID is necessary to sign an application for dependent students, then how would the parent sign that application and complete the application for the student? And we're talking about the FAFSA here. We're talking only about the FAFSA here. I'll, we'll get to the gate a little bit later. But how would the parent be able to sign the application for the student? Simple. Um, they have to mail in the signature page. So when the student um, is about is completing the application, they will get an option where they will be reminded that, hey, your parent needs to sign this. And if they can't sign this, print this out, give it to them so that they can sign it. And they'll have to mail it to the address that is on that specific um, signature page. So this is for parents. Once again, this is for families that are in mixed status households where the parent might not have a social security card or social security number, or in situations where the parent is having issues with their social security card, or for some reason, they they can't create an FSA ID, which happens even if they do have a social. Um, in those situations, the parent for a dependent student must still sign, but they have to submit it via a signature page. Once again, if you have questions about all this stuff, please ask away. We are here to help. I am seeing red in the Q&A, so that's a good sign y'all are asking. I'm happy. Continue to ask. We want to make sure that you soak out as much out of us as possible. Let's see. Next up. Okay, California Dream Act application. Who can apply? So we've talked about this undocumented students. And then the second bullet point, I cannot emphasize this enough. I know, even though it's called the California Dream Act, it may sound like it's related to DACA. It is a little confusing. Um, yeah, it is a little confusing. However, students with undocumented students with or without DACA can apply for the California Dream Act application. I will say that again. Undocumented students with or without DACA can apply for the California Dream Act application. And that is because DACA is a federal work program. It has nothing to do with financial aid. So if you don't have DACA and you're undocumented, you can still apply for the California Dream Act application. If you do have DACA, um, you have to apply for the California Dream Act application. Do not assume that because you have a DACA social security that you can now apply for the FAFSA. That's not how that works. You'd still have to apply for the California Dream Act application. So just want to clarify that just so that we can dispel any confusion around this. The next thing is TPS status, um, U visa holders. These are all individuals who would be able to apply for the California Dream Act application. And as you can see, there's the website at the bottom. It is actually an application we made at the California Senate Commission. And it mirrors the FAFSA a lot. Like we, I don't want to say we cut and paste, but pretty close to cutting and pasting. So a lot of the information matches. So that, and so that's why when I give this presentation, when someone from my team gives this presentation, we'll interchange between the two because a lot of the information in this presentation is applicable to both applications. But when we're specifically talking about one application, we'll make it clear. And if it's not clear, please feel free to ask. Now, okay, the California Dream Act application, what will you need? So you need a user ID and a password. So pretty much login information and security questions. Um, and that's kind of what you need. Once again, make sure you do not mess up your demographic information. Uh, that's 
we, you will be surprised how many people mess up their names. I cannot say this and I'm gonna keep on saying this. You're gonna get tired of me saying this, like, please don't mess up your name. So make sure you take care of that. You need a user ID and password. The parents will also need a user ID and password if the student is a dependent. And don't worry, we'll explain what a dependent student is later on within this presentation. So that is uh, the CADA. Make sure you get your user ID and password before you begin so that you can start filling out that application. Demographic information. Y'all see a recurring theme about this continuously coming up over and over and over again? Well, that's because we'll mess it up over and over and over again. Once again, please make sure you get your name right. I understand it can be difficult. You might have a hyphen, you might have an accent. That happens, totally get it. But make sure you get your name right. And once again, how do we do it? If you're filling out the FAFSA, make sure it's the name that matches what is on your social security card. If you are filling out the California Dream Act application, make sure it is the name that matches what is on your school records. I know this is a presentation earlier, so I'll just say this now. It's, it's, a, slide or it's a slide that will show up later, but I'll just say this now. The way it works is for high school seniors or if you're in community college, your school will upload your GPA to us. And then when you fill out your application, we need to match it. Um, we will get your application, your CADA or your FAFSA, and we need to match it with your GPA, right? And so we need to make sure that the name that the school used to upload your GPA matches the, uh, the name that you put in on your application. So if people call you Nikki, Billy, or yeah, Billy, and your name is William, please don't use a nickname, please, because they won't match and you won't be able to get aid and no one will be happy. So please just make sure you check that information. Make sure you're using the name that is on your social security card if you're applying for the PAFSA and make sure you're using the name that is on your school records if you're applying for the CADA. Date of birth. This one, um, it's, I think most people remember their date of birth, but this one, the reason why it comes up is when parents are saying, you know what, I just love my child so much, I'm going to fill out the whole application for them, or I know my child is not going to do this, so I'm going to do it for them. We still recommend, strongly recommend that, you know, the student fills out the student section, the parent fills out the parent section. However, the reason we do, the reason we do recommend this is because the parent will go in, right, say, you know what, I know my children, I'll fill out all this information. But they might have three children, and it might be a really long day, and you might forget whose birthday you're talking about. And so you might mix up the birthdays, and next thing you know, you're putting in the birthday of one sibling versus the other. How do you avoid this? You make sure that each person fills out the portion of the application that applies to them, and you make sure that you put in the correct information. So just putting that out there, correct address, you want to make sure that you're using an address that you will be comfortable receiving mail, um, at for a certain period of time. And then email address, once again, avoid institutional emails. Now, I still believe there's more slides which are going to make these same points that I just made right now, but I want to drill it in everybody's head not to mess these things up. As you can see, oh, there you go. It's not like I made this presentation. Actually, I didn't make this presentation. John made this presentation. So thanks, John, for putting this in there to remind us yet again that email, you want to make sure that email mail addresses are things that will remain active for extended periods of time. So please, please, please avoid institutional emails. Why do we keep on saying avoid institutional emails? Well, I'm glad you asked because what happens once you graduate high school and your high school decides to kick you off the server? Well, this will create a situation where you will no longer have access to your email. And remember we said you have to fill out these applications on a yearly rolling basis. So that creates a situation where you can now access your financial aid information because you filled, because you used your high school email or you use your community college email. So once again, we recommend use your own personal email that you know you're gonna have access to. Same thing with mail addresses. And so that's our main recommendation for all of this. Now, whose information goes on a FAFSA? Whew, this is the fun part. Now I could honestly just tell you, but I'd rather show you because it's, it's a nice way to show you. So we're gonna play this little game on who's my parent when I fill out my FAFSA. And the way we're gonna do it is just follow along and you will see, because the what I'm about to show you applies to any sort of situation. And also I know it says FAFSA there, but this also applies to the California Dream Act because remember why we just like cut and paste what's on the FAFSA and put it on the California Dream Act application. So just remember that this applies to both applications. Who's my parent? Let us begin this fun game. So are your parents married to each other? If the answer is yes, 
report both parents' information on the application. I'm going to move this a little bit lower. If the answer is no, if the answer, come on, if the answer is no, then the next question is, do your parents live together? Okay, so if your parents don't live together, then you report information for both parents on the application. And when we say FAFSA, once again, this applies to the FAFSA and the CADA. So even if they're not married, but they live together, then you're reporting both of the information on the application. If they're not married um, and they don't live together, then it raises another question. Did you live with one parent more than the other over the past 12 months? If the answer is yes, you report the information on the FAFSA for the parent who you lived with more. So remember, the parents weren't married and they don't live together. And now you lived with one more than the other. So you're just going to report the one who you lived with more than the other, if that situation applies to you. If the answer is no, and your parents are unmarried, don't live together, but you shared with them the equal amount of time, then you report the information on the application, FAFSA or CADA, for the parent who provided more financial support over the past 12 months or in the last year you received support. Now, this triggers some interesting question. So this scenario, this is for the scenario where there's two scenarios going on here. The first scenario was the parents don't are not married, don't live together, and you live with one parent more. So this, the question then is, has that parent remarried? And the other, in actually, yeah, let's go with this one first. Has that parent remarried? If that, ha if that parent has remarried, then yes, you report um, information for the step parent, for your step parent too, and no, then you don't need to report additional information. Same thing applies for the parent who, let's say you're in the situation where your parents are not married, don't live together, and then you lived with them equally, and but there's one parent who's providing more financial support than the other. That parent, if that parent has remarried, you report not only their information, but their your step parents' information on the application. If that parent has not remarried, then you don't need to report any more additional information. And that will cover 99% of the situations you will see on Who's My Parent? Thank you so much for coming to my favorite game show. Uh, if you have any questions about that, please, once again, we got some amazing people who can answer these questions a lot better than I can. So please take advantage of them, use them. I see a red dot just come up. Oh, there's a lot of questions about this. Perfect. Keep asking questions, people. Now, the following people are not parents unless they have legally adopted the student. We want to drill this. So widow step parent, aunts and uncles, foster parents, remember legally adopted. So a judge has said, okay, this student is adopted and this, yeah, this student has been adopted by this family. So even if they're foster parents, grandparents, older sisters or brothers, legal guardians. So don't, adoption won't count if it's done by a lawyer, it has to be done specifically by a judge. So if it's done by a private attorney, whatever kind of attorney, that won't count, it has to be done by a judge. So you wanna make sure that if you are in the situation, um, you still have to adopt, you still have to report your biological parents information unless these other individuals have legally adopted you. And once again, if you have any questions about that, please continue to ask, we are here for you. Now, Another thing which I mentioned earlier, remember how I said sometimes you have a situation where a parent goes in and says, I just love my kid so much, or I don't trust my kid at all, so I'm going to fill out this whole application. Well, you got to know that you make sure that you're filling out the correct application portions that apply to you. So first of all, we don't recommend that. Uh, we don't recommend one person filling out the application for everybody, so the parent filling out for the student or the student filling out for the parent. But we do recommend that each person fills out the portion of the application that pertains to them for the reason that they are more likely to get that information correct. Whereas if one person fills out the application for both the parent and the student, that could end up in the wrong information going in and that could hold up your application. So another thing we also wanna mention is, let's say you took our recommendation and both the student and the parent, dependent student, are filling out the application. One thing we wanna emphasize, make sure that when it's asking for student questions, you're giving answers about the student and then when they're asking for parent questions, you're giving answers about the parent. It sounds pretty simple, but this happens occasionally. And this happens pretty often where a student will fill out their own information for the parent section or the parent will fill out their own information um, where it's asking about the student information. Quick and easy pro tip is that the applications most of the time are talking about the student. And if they're talking about someone else, they will indicate that they're talking and they're asking for someone else's information. 
And how do you avoid that? Well, I'm going to show you. You can do that by, as you can see at the bottom, read each question carefully. So please, 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 we cannot emphasize enough. Please read each question carefully. Now, student gender. This is critical and very important. Um, if you are a student who is a male or who is assigned the male sex at birth, then you need to register for selective service. Um, so the way, so what, what I'm going to repeat that again. If you are a student who is male or was assigned the male sex at birth, then you need to indicate that you are male um, on your application and then you need to register for selective service. So the way the both applications work is it's not the um, the gender that you transition to, unfortunately, for those who have transitioned, it is the gender and sex that you were assigned when you were born. Um, so that's how the applications work. So even if you have a transgender student, um, a transgender uh, woman student, um, then if they were assigned the male sex at birth, then they need to um, identify themselves as male and they need to register for selective service. Um, so that is that is federal rule and just want to make sure so that um, students who fall into this category are not put in a situation where they don't register for selective service and, and that ends up holding up their financial aid. Because if you don't, if you're a male student or you were assigned the male sex at birth and you don't register for selective service, that will hold up your financial aid. Once again, if you have questions about this, please feel free to ask. There's great people who can answer your questions. And remember, use the Q&A function. Income and asset questions. Uh, I think we've pretty much gone over this uh, in saying don't confuse student income asset questions with uh, parent income and asset questions. So don't confuse those two things, but make sure that you're just answering all the questions. And then for the FAFSA filers, uh, specifically for the FAFSA filers, you have the opportunity to use what is called the IRS data retrieval tool. Um, please use that if possible. It just pretty much uploads the information from the IRS and puts it into your application and the schools that receive your application can see this information, makes things a lot simpler, makes it less likely for you to be selected for verification, which is a very long and arduous process where after you've completed your application, submitted it, um, you're, requ you're required to pretty much give out more documents to verify um, the information you put on the application. Not every student gets selected for this, uh, some students do, but it makes it less likely to get selected for this if you use the IRS data retrieval tool. So definitely recommend that. Um, please, 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 as much as you can. Unfortunately, this is not available for California GMAC application filers. So this is the, the IRS data retrieval tool. However, California GMAC application filers, you are still um, required to put in your income and asset information when prompted. Now, if you're unsure of the exact amounts, uh, which is something that happened, I was talking to a student who they said, hey, I'm filling out the application this year. And I realized I definitely had to file my taxes for 2019, but I didn't. And I said, okay, cool. Just make sure you put in the correct, uh, just estimate right now for now. Um, estimate where you think, how much you made and all that information. Answer those questions, submit it, get it in there before March 2nd, and then file your taxes and then correct later onwards. Uh, once your taxes have been filed and all that has been rectified. So just to say, if you don't know, estimate, get it in there, but you can still go back in there and correct. But if you do have that information already, your 2019 taxes and you have that information, just put in the right numbers right away. So some other common errors, and this is mainly dark to the high school seniors, because we know that these workshops tend to attract mainly high school seniors or mainly parents of high school seniors. Some common pitfalls we see, common errors. Uh, first of all, what will your high school completion status be when you begin college in, it should say 2021 to 2022 school year. It will be simple. It will be, um, you know, uh, I'm sorry, all your high school completion status, be, so your high school diploma, that's what you're getting. That's what you're getting. So don't overcomplicate it. Don't overthink it. You will be selecting your high school diploma. If, will you have your first bachelor's degree before you begin the 2021, 2022 school year? No, you won't. If you're a high school senior, you're not going to have that. And then... Uh, what will your grade level be when you begin the 2021-2022 school year? You will never attend the college first year. Uh, so just want to make sure you keep these answers simple. And then what college or degree certificate will you be working on when you begin the 2021-2022 school year? First bachelor's degree. The reason why we're just giving you the answers and the cheat codes to these is because students sometimes, specifically high school seniors, overthink these things. And so they mess up these questions. So our response is it's very straightforward. 
Um, if you're a high school senior, 99% of the time, this is going to be your answer for this group of questions. Please don't overthink it. Uh, because um, if you put second bachelor's degree, that then you wouldn't be able to access eight, certain kinds of eight. So just want to make that very clear. Um, make sure you don't overthink this if you are a high school senior. College selection. So one of the features that we can use on the college selection is the search engine. So for me, I went to the University of California, Santa Barbara. Whew, that's a mouthful. That is a lot. So instead of typing University of California, Santa Barbara, what I can do is I can just type in Santa. And that should bring up all the colleges that have Santa in their name. And so I can just click there. So that's a really quick and easy way to figure out and pick out your college. So that's one of our quick pro tips. Look at us helping you move through this application quicker. Uh, but yeah, please feel free to use that function because you know some of us don't know how to properly spell our colleges, which is unfortunate. I was in that boat. Barber really confused me for a long time. I didn't know where to put the R. So, but hey, just putting Santa allowed me to pick it. I knew, I was like, okay, there's the one. So this is something you can use the search function. But there is another more important thing when we're talking about college selection. Is everybody listen? Please, I have your attention here because this is extremely important. Very, very, very important. Now, in the college selection area, you can pick up to 10 colleges at a time, right? We recommend that in your initial list of 10, please pick at least one California school. Even better if you picked one UC one CSU, one private school, and one community college. Make things a lot better. Because what that means is then we can process you to see whether you would receive state aid. Now, some of you may be looking at this and say, okay, I don't know about California. I don't know, it's a little hot around here. Maybe I wanna to go to a different state. And you're thinking about that, like, you know what, California schools are not really in my top selection. Uh, why can't I just put them in this? Why, why can't I give my top 10, my first 10, uh, those priorities and then put my California schools later? Because it doesn't matter what order they put in. We just want to make sure in order for us to receive it, you do need to put those California schools initially in that list of 10. So just one, at least one. Make sure you put at least just one California school. But once again, we recommend one for each segment. Now, if you have like 20 schools, remember we said the limit is 10 at a time, you can always come back in a week later and put in the other schools you're thinking about. But this is extremely important because this will allow us to get your application to see even you know, if you qualify for something like the Cal Grant. And you know, you can know within a month or two if you qualify for the Cal Grant. I believe some people who submit the application like on October 1st, they know by like November, late November, whether they have a Cal Grant or not. And remember what I said, if you're going to a UC, that's a $12,000, 12572 somewhere there, dollar tuition and fee grant. And that can change your entire calculus if you know that if I stay in California, I can actually get all my tuition and fees covered versus if I go out of state, well, I have to pay out of state tuition. So extremely critical. We continuously recommend this. Please make sure you put some California schools in your initial list. And if you have more than 10 schools, then that's fine. Just come back in a week later. These schools don't even know what order you put them in. They're just going to be happy that, hey, someone was thinking about me. Someone sent me an application. So please, it doesn't hurt you. It only benefits you to put a California school, at least one, preferably one from each segment in your initial list of 10. Dependency questions. Now, remember how I said I would get to this? Look at me keeping my promises. I am going to get to this. So dependency questions. If you're a dependent student, the main thing is this. If you're a dependent student, you need your parent information on the application. If you're an independent student, you don't need your parent information on the application. So how is dependency determined? So there's a list of dependency questions. You can see some of them. Um, on my view, it's on the left-hand side, but I don't know how everybody's viewing it. I'm assuming everybody's viewing it, and it's on the left-hand side of the screen. But you can see some of the questions. Will you be 24 or older? Are you married or separated but not divorced? Do you have children receive more than half of their support from you? A bunch of these questions. If you answer no to all these questions, these dependency questions, which will be on your FAFSA or CADA, if you answer no to all of them, then you're a dependent. But I know what you're instantly thinking. Man, Eddie, Edwin, I'm like, I'm over 18, I'm an adult, I'm free, or my parents don't want to pay for my education, and all these different reasons. Unfortunately, I don't make the rules, I'm sorry. The federal government makes the rules, and these are the rules that they have set. So if you answer no to all these questions, the dependency questions, they will determine you a dependent student, and you do need parent information to complete your application. Now, if you answer yes to any one of these questions, 
then you may be an independent student. But what will most likely happen is you will be asked for additional um, verification to verify your status as an independent student. And essentially, you will not need your parents. Once you verify that, OK, you are an independent student, you won't need your parents' information and uh, signature in order to complete your application. Now, I know this raises a lot of questions. Actually, I can look at it. No, no one's asking questions. Come on, people, ask questions. Please, please, ask questions. But I know for some of you, I hypothetically assume this is raising a lot of questions. Well, what if my parent lives in another country? What if I'm a student in, in the United States and my parent lives in another country? And you know, I fill out the application and it says, I'm a dependent student. I answer no to all those questions. Well, you still need to get your parents' information from that other country into the application. You need to get it in there. Now, that's not to say that in the applications, we don't understand that there's special circumstances. We know that there's special circumstances. So let's say for some reason, you can, you're can you not in communication with your parents, like it's a hostile situation or you can't get access of them or you can't put in the information for whatever reason. You should go to your financial aid office, not us, your financial aid office, and they'll be able to make a evaluate the situation, make a professional judgment, and pretty much they can make you an independent student. Um, so, but then they'll probably have uh, some their own documentation and requirements and all these things. So it's kind of subjective to the institution that you go to. So please just check in with them if you're trying to override that status. So once again, if you have questions, please ask in the Q&A. There's great people ready and willing to answer your questions in the Q&A. Household size. So this one, the easiest way to explain this is because if you're the head of household, right, and this is not based on tax information, this is not based on tax information, that's the first bullet point you can see there, it's not based on um, tax information, but this is how this is calculated. So listen carefully. If the head of household is supporting an individual, so this could be an aunt, an uncle, um, a cousin, all these different people, if they're supporting them 50% or more, and that individual also lives in the, under the same roof as the head of household, then that individual will be counted as a part of your household size. That's how the calculation works. Now, if the head of household is sending money to people, 50% um, or more, let's say they're supporting a family in a different country, those individuals, um, those cousins, uncles, aunts, they will not be counted as a part of your household. The, if the rule is that you have to live with the head of household, then you have to be supported by the head of household to be counted as a part of the household size. Now, the exception to this rule is students. Because why? Because students go to college. Um, so children, if you're a child of the head of household and you're a student and you're going to college, you don't need to live with the head of household in order to count as a part of the household, uh, the household size. Uh, you just need to be in a situation where you are being supported 50% plus or more in the coming academic year by this individual. So that's kind of how it works. If you have questions about that, please, please, please feel free to ask once again um, in, in, in the Q&A, people can walk you through that. They'll be able to answer your question. Selective service. We talked about this and I cannot emphasize this enough. So every, every individual who's assigned the male sex at birth needs to register for selective service. And don't worry people, we're almost at the end. We're about to wrap it up. So I know, I know people might be getting a little tired. Don't give up on me, we're almost there. So, but let's get through this stuff. Selective service. Every student who's assigned the male sex needs to register for selective service. Now, if you don't do that, that will hold up your financial aid. So for files of files, it's pretty simple for y'all. Like all you have to do is just click a box uh, while you're filling out the application and that's it. K to file is, it's a little more complicated. And I know this may be a very sensitive issue for some of some K to filers who are filing the California GMAT application. Because register for selective service, there is a fear that you know that information might be shared with other government entities. I want to make this very clear: um, it's not. It is not shared with other government entities. It is not shared with other government entities. Um, so please do not worry about registering for selective service. It's not shared with other government entities. All you have to do is register, and that would allow you to receive your the aid um, you need or you've fallen. You pretty much met the requirements for. So I want to make that very clear. And the other thing that is extremely important, specifically for CADA files, because we said FAFSA files, all you have to do is check a box. CADA files, you don't have that option to just check a box. You have to mail it in. Now, if you know you're going to college and you're about 17 years and three months, you can mail this in the moment you turn 17 years and three months. You can register for selective service. So please um, 
take care of that um, as soon as possible and register for selective service. So if you have any questions about this, please, once again, ask in our Q&A function. So special circumstances. Remember how I said at the beginning of the presentation, you know, there's always special circumstances that come up. Well, here they are. So what are some of them? Uh, well, the obvious, right? We're going through a global pandemic. People are losing their jobs. 2019 does no way reflects near what's going on in 2021, right? So uh, we understand this. And I, the federal government understands if you're applying for the FAFSA, and we understand this if you're applying for the CADA. We get it. And so the way what's happened is the federal government has given colleges the authority to make a professional judgment. So if you're in a situation where loss of job or income or there's been a divorce that's affected the income, death in the family, all of these unexpected circumstances, these are things you can go to your college about, your college's financial aid office, and they can make that professional judgment. So once again, remember I talked about dependency status. This is the same process. Uh, once you've submitted your applications, and you can now, you, and you know which colleges you submit your applications to and you're getting a financial aid award, you can call them and say, hey, I have this particular situation. And can this allow me to be either become an independent status or can I qualify for more aid or can you change my expected family contribution? Because the situation I had in 2019 is no longer the situation I currently have. So there is exceptions and it really just depends on your institution. They'll probably ask for documentation um, but please make sure that you are on top of this as soon as possible and that you're going to visit your financial aid office so that they can make that professional judgment that they have the power to make. So I know I haven't actually said this as March. March 2nd deadline, I know, it's, I, I can't believe I haven't said it as much considering how close we are to the March 2nd deadline. Okay, so some of you may wonder, okay, why is this in red? Why did he start shouting? Why is this so important? Well, let me explain it to you. March 2nd deadline. Here's the difference. If you're applying for financial aid and you want to qualify for, um, let's say, for example, the Cal Grant, the way the Cal Grant works is it's a priority deadline. So if you meet all the requirements for Cal Grant, remember the tuition paying grant, the tuition and fee paying grant, and you apply before March 2nd, you meet all the requirements, then you will be entitled to that award, meaning you're going to get that award. You're entitled to it. If you apply post March 2nd, even if you meet the requirements for it, but you apply post March 2nd, you are now in what is called the competitive pool. Why is it called competitive, Eddie? Well, you have a one in eight chance of getting this award. I believe the numbers uh, numbers are kind of rough, but I believe there's about 300,000 students yearly who qualify wearing the competitive pool and only about 40,000 roughly awards. So it's, 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 it's cutthroat. It's really cutthroat, it's competitive. And all you have to do is just apply before March 2nd to not be in that situation. So that's why we constantly emphasize March 2nd, March 2nd, March 2nd, March 2nd, because it can really be the difference whether you are entitled to a grant, to grant aid, whether you're competing with a bunch of other students, uh, even despite the fact that you do qualify for that same grant aid, you're competing for it and might not even get it. So please fill out your application on time. Web grants for students account. Uh, this is a great way for, after you completed your application, you can check the progress of your application. Um, web grants for students is a great way to empower you to be able to take your financial aid situation to your own hands and you can check and the beautiful part about web grants is if you're missing something it will tell you if something is going wrong it will tell you it looks like there's some activity going on in the chat i'm assuming that's probably john yesenio or humphrey posting the web grants information in there but if it's not please 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 direct your questions to the uh, Q&A function, it's a lot easier if they're done there. But yeah, we will post, you. we will have a slide which will have the Web Grants um, website so you all can go check it out. And if we don't, hopefully John and Yesenia or Humphrey can post uh, the website link to access it. But yeah, that's what Web Grants is for. Once you've submitted your application, students, you can go and create an account and you can check on the progress of your application. Check your email. Oh, emails are back at it again. So we're talking about emails again. And remember, this is the importance of, once again, you want to make sure you're using a personal email that's going to remain active. One, I'll reemphasize that point. And two, we want you to check your email because remember how I talked about verification earlier where you've completed, you submitted, and then you get an email saying, actually, we need additional information to verify what's on your application. You won't know that unless you're checking your email. So please check your email because if you don't go through that verification process, if you if you are selected, if you don't finish it, then that will hold up your financial aid. So you want to make sure you're checking your email so that if there's something that's required, something that's missing, 
or you are selected for verification and you need to submit verification documents that you are on top of that so that by the time the school year begins, you're good to go. Your financial aid is rolling and you've got all the money that you need. Final helpful hint, don't be afraid to ask for help. This is why we're here. And you know what's a great way to ask for help? By using that Q&A function and asking questions. Please, please, please ask for help. We're here for you. You can, once again, you can call the federal hotline or you can call us. I believe our number is about to come up pretty shortly. And, but yeah, you can call us and we'll help you. Or in some case situations, as you saw, you should probably be contacting your financial aid office. Or once again, you can also contact Senator Umberg's office. They're very nice, they're friendly. I work with them, they're great people. They don't bite, I promise. So please, there's a lot of people who are here to help you. Please take advantage of that fact. Let them help you. Common application mistakes. Okay, uh, the application was not submitted for the correct academic year. So we're in 2021, 20, 2022. So because that's the financial aid application, that's what the application is being submitted for, for the academic year of 2021, 2022. So once again, please make sure that you're submitting the application for the correct year. And the beautiful thing is once you've done one application, it allows you to, uh, it, you can just, the it has a memory where you, for the next year when you apply again, it would take a lot of that information from the previous application, just put it there if some if nothing has changed. So please make sure, once again, you're filling it out for the correct year. We're in the year 2021, 2022. That's the application you should be filling out. Mm, the application was submitted after the March 2nd deadline. Whew. Don't do this to yourself. I already told you why you shouldn't do this to yourself. It's not worth it. There's, don't, don't be a risk taker. You've got a couple of days. If you have not started on it, what is, what is the date today? February 24? You got a couple of days. Get on it. Come on. Fill out that application. Please, please, please. Don't, don't potentially miss out on a lot of aid just because you don't potentially miss out on all this aid just because you fill out the application on the wrong date or post March 2nd. Don't do that, please. Get it in on time. And also for the middle class scholarship, you want to qualify for that March 2nd deadline. You want to get that in on time. So this is not just for Cal grants, this is also for the middle class scholarship. So please get that information in on time. Mandatory question was not answered. Um, it, the beautiful thing about these applications, they will tell you. Uh, typically, it's something in red saying, hey, go back to that. You need to answer that. So please make sure you do that. Application was not signed by a parent. This is for dependent students. We've already explained what dependency is. So I'm not going to repeat that. Application was saved, but not submitted. Make sure that you are submitting that. Make sure that you're checking that. Um, you know, my favorite method is once I've completed when I was doing this was always making sure I got my confirmation email saying I'm done. So make sure you're looking out for that. Require pay, required paper signature was required, but not sent. Uh, so this is for the parents. If you are a parent, and you're having problems with your social or you don't have a social and therefore you cannot use an FSA ID to sign the application, please make sure that you're getting this information in the mail in signature page as soon as possible. Um, and there was other unresolved errors on the application. I think that's pretty self-explanatory. Um, and once again, these applications will tell you. So with that, it's been a fun ride, people. I think, we, um, yeah, we're pretty much towards the end of our presentation. But before we leave, we also wanted to, you know, plug our social media. As I like to always say, please follow us. There's no guarantees that we'll follow you back. But in return, we can guarantee that you get a lot of great information, a lot of great information about what we're doing and a lot of great updates about financial aid. So please follow us back. Um, yeah, and we promise to give you great information, but no promises on following you back. But here you can see our Twitter account, our Instagram account, for those of you who prefer the pictures, they're just tweets, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, YouTube. We have some great resources on YouTube. Please check them out. We really update our social media. It looks a lot nicer. Lots of great resources there. So please, please, please take a screenshot of this and follow us out there. And then some grateful, helpful websites, as well as a number at the bottom that you can call. So let's start off with the CSAC website. Uh, CSAC website, that's kind of the one-stop shop for state aid and figure out state questions. Um, yeah, please check that out for great resources. We're, we're here to help you check out our website. Uh, the dream.csac.ca.gov, that is for those of you who are filing the California Dream Act application. Please check that out if, you're, if that applies to you. Um, that's where you would find the application. And remember when I mentioned web grants earlier, the mygrantinfo.csac.ca.gov, that's how you access web grants. And if you prefer to talk to people and call them, you can always call us on that number below. We're open during business hours. We will help you and we'll try our best to help you. And yeah, we'll try our best pretty much. Now, 
Also, I don't have it in here, but we do have another statewide cash flow college webinar tomorrow. Uh, statewide cash flow college webinar, pretty much where, in addition to this same presentation, we'll pretty much have a hotline. And so, if you feel like, hey, uh, you think of a question, you go back to your application, you think of a question, you can always join us tomorrow. It's going to be happening from 5:30 to 8 p.m. Yesenia and John or Humphrey, if you could just put that in the chat. Just in case you have some questions, um, please feel free to hop onto that too. But hopefully we got through to all of your questions for this one. So I'm gonna leave this slide up for like five seconds before I go to the next one. Three, two, one. Thank you. And yeah, that's it. That is it. I told y'all we were close to finishing and we are now done. So that is it. Thank you for joining us today. We appreciate you. Uh, love the fact we are allowed, also like to thank Senator Umbridge's office for having us and letting us present to you about financial aid. Also like to thank the amazing work that was done by John, Yesenia, and Humphrey for really working those chats and getting through to your questions. I see that the questions are still coming up because I know we see some unanswered questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to stop talking for now and I'm just going to pretty much stop sharing my screen pretty soon and just let um, John, Humphrey, and Yesenia answer those questions. And yeah, if you think of anything, please feel free to continue to ask and we'll be here up until there's no more questions left and then we will end the webinar. So thank you.
Okay, it looks like John is getting to the last question. Thank you, John, Humphrey, and Senya for answering all those questions. And thank you, Team Umberg, for posting all those resources in the chat. Thank you, thank you, everybody, so much. Uh, yeah, it doesn't look like there's any more questions left. So we're going to give it about two minutes. If no question comes up, we'll end the webinar. But please, uh, if you think of a question, even if it's at minute 59, don't be shy. Post the question and we'll answer it. We're here for you.
Mm, okay, looks like we're still answering questions. So please keep them coming. We are here to help you out as much as possible. So please, if you have a question, continue to ask those questions and we'll keep going as long as y'all ask those questions. So if you still have questions, please feel free to ask them. 